Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show that's usually about comparing films to the books they're based on. Yes, despite the lack of Lost in Adaptation in the title, this is the first of a three-parter I'm doing on the Phantom of the Opera because I just couldn't resist a chance to fully explore another story that's evolved through multiple mediums. If someone mentions the Phantom of the Opera, odds are they're referring to the 1980s musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber and for good reason, it's one of the most successful plays of all time. Phantom won all of the frickin' awards, made Bill Billions of dollars being shown in 145 cities across 27 countries and is the second longest running West End musical. However, it was most certainly not the birthplace of the famous opera ghost. He'd already made his debut 76 years earlier in France in the form of a novel written by Gaston Leroux. Weber's musical was so successful it's safe to say it has pretty much eclipsed its source material at this point and it's also inspired multiple adaptations of its own into film form. What I plan to do is first give you a full synopsis and review of the book to see if it was really worth all this fuss, and then I'm going to do two episodes of Lost in Adaptation, first seeing how the musical differed from the book, then seeing how the film differed from the musical. I'm going to look at the 25 year anniversary at the Royal Albert Hall to represent the musical, because even though it might not have been the perfect venue for a production of Phantom, I'm pretty sure it's the only official recording of the play. The film was a harder decision because there were so many good options to choose from, it's the bad one. It's the 2004 one directed by Joel Schumacher and starring Gerard Butler because, well, Life, like YouTubers, can be a real bastard sometimes. Just before I jump into a rundown of the book, if you watch the reviews I did for The Three Musketeers, you might remember that despite my best efforts, I am laughably bad at pronouncing French names, so my deepest apologies in advance for what I'm about to put French speakers through. Gaston Leroux was a French journalist turned author. He apparently originally wanted to be a lawyer, but squandered his vast inheritance living like a rock star and ended up having to take a day job as a writer to pay his bills. Though The Phantom of the Opera is what he's most remembered for in the English-speaking world, during his career in France he gained fame primarily for his crime mystery novels, taking inspiration from Edgar Allan Poe and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to write such popular works as The Mystery of the Yellow Room. The Phantom of the Opera was originally serialised in 1909, then republished as a complete work in 1910. In the introduction, LaRue, writing as himself, claims that the opera ghost was totes real, and this book is a reconstruction of actual events that he's collated from journal extracts and witness testimonies. There's enough provable falsehoods to his statements to make it pretty clear this is just a gimmick he's trying out, like when the Blair Witch Project first came out and all the marketing was based around going, oh yeah, no, this is uh, very real, uh, we just found this footage, don't mind the interviews with the cast or anything. Fortunately, it's a dramatic recreation and he summarises a lot, so it's not quite on the same level as, say, Dracula, where the whole thing is past tense diary entries and you end up wondering how all of these characters have compulsively written down every detail of their lives as soon as it happens. This format does result in a certain non-linear element to the book's story, though. Some chapters describe the events of of the same period of time from multiple people's perspectives, sometimes setting up a very strange interaction that confuses the reader at first, but makes a little more sense a bit later when you hear what happened from the other party's point of view. Now it's universally true that no matter how detailed it is, you'll never get the same sort of experience from hearing a summary of a book as reading it for yourself, but because I'm certainly not going to recreate that particular writing choice, I should warn you that hearing this synopsis from me is going to be even more removed from how the author intended for you to enjoy the story than usual, so if you've not read this book, please Please keep that in mind before passing judgement on it. Ok, let's synopsisize. The time, the 1880s. The place, France. The Paris Opera House. The establishment is in the process of changing hands from the two previous owners to Fermin Richard and his financial partner Armand Monchamar. On the former management's last day in charge, the chief stage mechanist Joseph Bouquet is found dangling from a noose in the basement beneath the stage. It's deemed to have been suicide by investigators despite the rope that was used to kill him mysteriously vanishing when they returned to collect the body. This prompts the previous owners to come clean to Richard and Monchemar about something that they'd been hiding from them, that for years now they had been plagued by some very strange goings on at the opera that were attributed to a ghost that lives there and had supposedly just been sighted just before Bouquet was killed. He was said to sometimes appear as a well-dressed man with a terrible death's head, which I assumed at first meant a skull mask, but apparently refers to a face so ugly it might as well be a skull. Other sightings described him as a floating disembodied head that's somehow on fire but not burning up. They had become so convinced that this ghost actually existed they had bowed to several extraordinary demands that supposedly came from him. Namely, they paid a 20,000 franc salary to him every month and kept Box 5, a high value private viewing balcony free during every performance for his use. They warned the new owners that terrible things tend to happen if the ghost wishes are not met, things like stagehands being found mysteriously dead by apparent suicide. Neither Richard nor Monchamar believe a word of it and laugh the whole thing off. The death of Bouquet is kept secret for the rest of the day to not ruin the night's performance. The usual star of the show 
a famous Spanish soprano named Carlotta had taken ill, and a hitherto unknown singer named Christine Dai had stepped in to fill her role and had absolutely flattened the audience with her amazing singing before being so overcome with emotion she fainted right on stage. Amongst the audience that night was a French aristocrat, Count Philippe de Chani, and his younger brother, the Viscount Raoul. Raoul recognizes Christine as the girl that he had met and fallen in love with when they were children. He goes to visit her after the performance, but she does not appear to remember him, and humiliates him somewhat by laughing at his blurted out story about how they met when he rescued her scarf that had blown out to sea. He goes a little butthurt stalker on her and sneaks back to her dressing room later, where he hears a man's voice from within demanding that Christine love him, and her replying that she sang just for him tonight and has already given him her soul. After Christine leaves to go home, Raoul breaks into her room to confront his new love rival, but is confused to find no one there. Over the next few weeks, as Richard and Monchamar are taking over the running of the opera house, they receive several notes signed by the opera ghost reminding the gentleman about the OG's salary and box five. They are eloquently worded and in striking red ink, but written in a clumsy, childish handwriting. Finally starting to suspect that this might be more than just a practical joke, especially after reports that people who were seated in box five heard a disembodied voice telling them that it was occupied, the pair interview several employees about this mysterious ghost. The concierge, a very old woman by the name of Madame Geary, claims to have never seen him, but had often been spoken to by the ghost when he requested certain things in his box during performances, and even claimed to have been tipped generously by him on many occasions. The managers immediately had her fired for being obviously mad. Meanwhile, a confused and angry Raoul is sliding into Christine's DMs by sending her letters, until she finally replies and admits that she was only pretending not to recognize him, and tells him that she is returning to the village in Normandy where they met as children to visit her father's grave on the anniversary of his death. Raoul decides to uh, follow her there and takes a train to Normandy. The book then fills us in on Christine's backstory. She was the daughter of a famous Swedish violin player who came to Paris to seek his fortune, but took ill and died, promising her in his final days that once he was in heaven he would seek out an angel of music and send him to earth to finish teaching her how to sing. When he finally tracks Christine down at the inn, she doesn't seem surprised to see Raoul, he blurts out a confession of love for her and is laughed at again. Hurt, he confronts her about the man in her dressing room, which in turn hurts her feelings for believing that she would be the kind of girl who would invite a man into her dressing room after hours. She parts tearfully, but they meet again in a local graveyard, and she tells him that the voice that he heard was the angel of music that her father had sent to her from heaven to turn her into an amazing singer, and that was how she gave such an amazing performance on her first night. Not believing her, Raoul insists that whoever has been teaching her music is an imposter just pretending to be an angel. Christine once again leaves in tears. Later that night, Raoul hears Christine leaving the inn and continues stalking her. He follows her back to the graveyard and hears the most amazing violin music coming from her father's tomb, presumably being played on the instrument he was buried with. Seeing a dark figure, he attempts to grab him, but is confronted with a death's head face and glowing golden eyes, so terrifying that Raoul faints dead away and is found the next morning unconscious on the steps of the church, half frozen to death. Christine takes care of him and they return to Paris once he's recovered. Back at the opera house, relations between Richard, Monchema, and the opera ghost have broken down considerably as they have refused to bow to his demands and keep trying to discover his identity to no avail. One such demand was to permanently replace the now recovered Carlotta with Christine as lead singer and to rehire Madame Geary as the box manager. When this is not done, Carlotta's voice, through seemingly dark magic, fails her mid-song and she appears to make some sort of horrific quacking noise instead. Much, much worse, the massive chandelier that's suspended over the audience falls right onto the head of Madame Geary's replacement, killing her instantly. To top it all, Christine mysteriously disappears that night. When Raoul searches for her, her caretaker, Madame Valerius, a elderly lady who was friends with her father, tells him that she's gone to stay with her angel of music for a bit. She also warns him that Christine can never truly be with him because the angel said that he would have to go back to heaven if she ever got married. Madame Valerius appears to have partaken of the Kool-Aid pretty hard, as she sees nothing unusual in the idea of a supernatural heavenly teacher who's also possessive and jealous. Raoul concludes that this old woman's madness is probably a factor in why Christine was so easily taken in by whoever is pretending to be this angel. Christine eventually sends Raoul another letter, apparently by throwing it out of a carriage onto the street in the hopes that some kind soul would find and deliver it, which surprisingly actually worked. She arranges to meet with him during a masquerade ball at the opera house, but before they can discuss anything, Raoul sees a man he believes to be her mysterious teacher walking around dressed as the Red Death from the Edgar Allan Poe story and tries to attack him. Christine restrains him, which Raoul considers to be enough of a betrayal to berate and insult her, and she once again walks away from him emotionally distraught. Later, he goes looking for her in her dressing room, and finding it empty, decides to go in and have a look around anyway. When he hears Christine coming, he hides in the inner room and witnesses her expressing pity for a man called Eric. While wrestling with his sense of entitled anger that she is daring to lament this Eric person instead of him, Raoul is shocked to hear a voice singing to her from a full 
full length wall mirror. Christine approaches it and seems to vanish right before his eyes. Once again, she reappears sometime later and he goes to visit her and her adopted mother to finally get some answers. Christine, where on earth did you disappear to again? Oh, she's been off with her angel of music again. Ah, oh, he's lovely. Uh, Mama, I thought we agreed we weren't going to talk about the angel and also there is no angel. That would be crazy. <laughs> you are correct that there is no angel. He's an imposter. Are you wearing a wedding ring? What? No. Madam, I believe your adopted daughter is in clear and present danger. From who? From the angel. I thought you just said there is no angel. There isn't. Thanks for dropping by, Viscount. Weirdly though, shortly later, Christine meets him yet again and confesses mutual feelings for him. She seems to be under the impression that a romance between them would be doomed, but suggests that they get secretly engaged anyway, and they sort of pseudo-date for a while. They actually appear to be getting on for once, and Christine's career as a singer seems to be going from strength to strength now that Colotta believes she's cursed. Eventually though, Raoul can no longer take the jealousy over her wearing the angel's ring and interrogates her again. Christine appears to have finally come to trust Raoul enough to tell him the full story, and it's a doozy. She leads him up to the roof of the opera house, and and somewhat unsurprisingly reveals to him that the opera ghost and her angel of music are the same person, and he had started communicating with her through her mirror and giving her singing lessons a few months before. Being superstitious, she had initially thought that it was indeed the angel that her father had promised to send her. However, this didn't last as long as you might think. The ghost eventually had her walk up to the mirror, and she inexplicably found herself in a secret tunnel with him. She thinks that he must have drugged her at this point, because she has only vague memories of a short trip on a horse that had been stolen from the opera, then a ride on a boat across a massive underground lake to a house on the far side of it. When her senses finally returned to her at the ghost subterranean abode, Christine got a good look at the guy for the first time and quickly realised that he was seriously lacking in angelic qualities. Contrary to her expectations, instead of being transported into a magical realm of music, she was in fact in a sewer with a creepy, smelly man wearing a skull mask called Eric. Please bear in mind that that probably sounded more exotic and foreign to a 19th century Frenchman. To an English speaker... There are some who call me... Tim? Eric is a tad weird to say the least. If his kidnapping and drugging her hadn't been enough of a giveaway, he also reveals that he willingly sleeps in a coffin and sometimes spends weeks not eating or sleeping, just composing his masterpiece opera. He professes his undying love for Christine, and while she is deeply disappointed that he wasn't what she expected, she is still quite impressed with his incredible singing and musical skills. She might even have been willing to let him continue to be her friend and teacher, but she becomes super curious about what he looks like underneath the mask and pulls it off him. Underneath, Eric apparently looks like he's been been dead for several years and his yellow eyes glow in the dark like a cat's. He's pretty pissed at her for yunking his mask and yells at her for a bit, then says that because she's seen his horrible, horrible face, he knows that she'll never return if he lets her leave, so now he's gonna have to keep her prisoner forever. Christine does the only sensible thing in this scenario and lies like crazy for a fortnight, convincing him that if he were to let her go, she would love to come back to this dark, damp underground house of doom and gloom to visit him regularly. He eventually agrees to let her go on the condition that she wears a ring that he gave her and promises to come back whenever he wants to see her. Eric is so pathetic and sad at their parting. Despite everything, overly kind-hearted Christine is filled with pity for him and decides to keep the promise she made under duress and return regularly to continue singing lessons with him. However, upon every return visit, she's become more and more frightened of Eric as he seems to be getting more and more insistent that she love him the way that he loves her. So now she's willing to run away from the opera with Raoul. In classic Christine fashion though, she does want to do it immediately. She wants to stay one more night and sing for Eric one last time to lessen the blow of her leaving for him. I should mention that this narrative of Christine's story was often cut up and interlaced in the book with more shenanigans involving Richard and Monchamar failing to get to the bottom of this opera ghost business. Unfortunately, neither Christine nor Raoul noticed that Eric was right behind them this entire conversation and has heard everything. Raoul's big brother, the Count, is super not into the idea of him marrying a common singer, but Raoul gives him the you're not the boss of me man treatment and makes arrangements anyway. Alas, during her final performance, Christine vanishes from the stage in a flash of light before the eyes of the entire audience and no one can find her. The story segues once again to tell a long, humorous story about Richard and Monchumar attempting to track down whoever is pretending to be the ghost, using the reinstated Madame Giri, and getting hoodwinked out of the money that they were using as bait multiple times. As you can probably tell, the slipping sanity of these men is a recurring theme in this story. Anyway, getting back to the A plot, Raoul is pretty desperate to find Christine, though he has no idea where to start looking 
thinking until he is approached by a mysterious foreign man known only as the Persian who offers to help him. The Persian had popped up once or twice throughout the story in a very minor capacity. He was known as an eccentric who was allowed to wander around the opera house despite not working there. Every now and again he would whisper something to a lead character that suggested that he knew more about the opera ghost than the average person. The full scope of the Persian's shared history with Eric is revealed slowly in bits and pieces over the remaining chapters. For the sake of keeping things simple, I'm just going to lay out the OG's whole backstory now. Despite his name, Eric was actually born in France, the son of a super talented mason. Both his parents despised him for being born so hideously deformed, so he ran away at a young age and spent a good portion of his life travelling around and learning lots of different skills. It turns out that, in a weird karmic counterweight to being born super ugly, Eric was naturally very, very talented at a lot of things. His singing and music playing was incredible, he became a genius architect and mechanist, and he even learned how to be a master ninja assassin, because why not? He spent some time in a carnival as a sort of combination of freak show, magician, and pioneer ventriloquist, then was invited to travel to Persia at the behest of the Sultana, who he would go on to teach and entertain by horribly murdering people in front of her. While he was there, he took part in multiple political assassinations, and used his architectural skills to help build cool palaces for the ruling class. Eventually it was decided that he just knew too much, and a Daroga, which is a kind of chief of police, was ordered to have him executed. The Daroga was the man who would eventually become known as the Persian. He had a soft spot for Eric, so helped him escape at the cost of his own banishment. Both men ended up moving to France, where Eric once again put his genius architect skills to good use by designing and building the very Paris Opera House that he now lives in. Sick of the world and its treatment of him, Eric had a secret home for himself built on the shores of the underground lake beneath its foundations, and secret passages installed throughout the building that would allow him to travel around unnoticed. Eric was at this point completely devoid of human empathy, feeling he had been so screwed over by life, the universe, and everything, he was no longer obliged to be bound by any constraints of civilized society, or the desire to show kindness to others no matter how innocent they were of wronging him. The Persian had called on him a few times, mostly to admonish him for his latest murder. As Eric owed him his life, he was the only person he didn't kill on sight if discovered in his cave. For example, it's deduced that Joseph Bouquet, the man who was found hanged at the start of the story, stumbled upon his lair and suffered his dark fate because of it. It's revealed that it was partly due to the Persian's insistence that Eric agreed to let Christine go the first time he kidnapped her, though it's pretty clear that the Droga's influence on him is limited because he still kept her for the better part of a month. After decades of letting Eric get away with gruesome murders with little more than a telling off, this probably permanent second kidnapping of Christine has finally convinced the Persian to actually do something about him, so he teams up with Raoul and shows him how the spinning mirror that Eric built into Christine's room works. He gives him an old pistol to hold, even though he doesn't think they'll actually get a chance to use it on Eric. It's actually just a way to get Raoul to hold his hand up at the level of his eyes, because Eric's weapon of choice is the Punjab. I did some research and I think this is a weapon that the room made up. It's like a noose-like lasso that he could skillfully throw over someone's neck and strangle them with if they weren't blocking it. While this is kind of clever, I think it would have been quicker and easier to just tell him exactly that, rather than constantly having to remind him to raise his hand like he ends up having to do as they sneak up to Eric's house. While they're en route through the tunnels, they're suddenly confronted with the disembodied, fiery head that the opera employees sometimes witnessed. It floats past them, followed by an army of rats, and shit gets weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. Uh, I'm the rat catcher. Uh, if you don't move, you'll be fine. So, uh, yeah. I'm just gonna go this way with me rats. Bye. Anyway, when that seemingly very random digression is over with, they finally get to their destination and slip in for a side door, which unfortunately turns out to lead straight to Eric's personal torture chamber that he apparently, uh, has. It's a complex room made entirely out of reinforced mirrors, with a big metal tree in the middle that has a noose hanging from it. When people are trapped inside, it slowly heats up and causes them to dehydrate and hallucinate. Once they're really doolally, Eric uses various instruments to simulate the sounds of rain or animal noises, further exacerbating their insanity until they inevitably end up killing themselves to escape it. Raoul and the Persian hear Christine and Eric talking in the next room. Not surprisingly, Eric is demanding that she marry him and hints that there will be terrible consequences if she refuses. He pops out for a bit because some sort of alarm system went off letting him know that someone was coming, and he returns later boasting that he just drowned someone. Unfortunately, we learn later that it was Raoul's big brother who had come to try and find him. There's also a long scene that makes a huge deal out of him showing off his ventriloquism and his uncanny ability to throw his voice and sound like he's talking from another part of the room. When he realises that he has yet more 
guests, he decides that the Persian has pushed his luck with him one too many times, so he's going to leave him and his love rival Raoul to die in the torture chamber. They both very nearly do, but fortunately, the Persian is somewhat aware of how the torture chamber works and manages to find the secret exit just before they succumb. They find themselves in a long tunnel filled as far as the eye can see with barrels of what turns out to be gunpowder. Eric has rigged the opera house to explode if Christine doesn't agree to marry him. He has apparently given her two levers that she can turn. One is shaped like a grasshopper and the other a scorpion. If she turns the scorpion, then she has agreed to marry him and the gun part of room will be flooded with water, rendering it harmless. If she turns the grasshopper, then well, uh... Boom. The Persian is concerned that Eric has gone so completely nuts that both levers might blow them all to kingdom come, but Christine eventually decides to risk turning the scorpion. True to his word, it does indeed start flooding the gunpowder room, but it doesn't stop there and starts to fill the room containing Raoul and the Persian as well. Christine bargains for their lives by promising Eric to not only marry him, but to be his living wife, a statement dripping with deeper meaning. While Eric is considering his options, both his prisoners semi-drown, but the Persian revives shortly later, mysteriously back at his own home. Raoul and Christine are still missing, and the police assume that the Persian is a loony when he tries to tell them what happened. However, in a surprising twist, soon after, he's visited by Eric, who claims that he did have both of them locked up, but he's let them go now. Apparently, his marriage with Christine only lasted one evening. Eric had taken off his mask and kissed Christine's forehead, and despite everything he'd done, and, you know, him looking like something out of a John Carpenter film, she had kissed him back. Eric had never been kissed before, not even by his mother, and that one act of compassion was enough to fill him full of so much love, he was literally dying of it. Yeah, the original Phantom of the Opera went out in a sort of reverse Padme. His last request was that Christine personally bury him somewhere secret with the gold ring that he gave her, which she agrees to do before eloping with Raoul. The book ends with a wrap-up where LaRue recaps Eric's life and definitively debunks all his magical powers by explaining how he used his various hidden passages, trapdoors, sleight of hands, ventriloquism, and throwing his voice skills to do all the things that convinced people that he was a ghost. He also mentions that Eric's skeleton was eventually discovered many years later, still wearing the gold ring that Christine had slipped onto his finger when she buried him. In the last line of the book, he says that he's going to suggest placing his remains in the National Academy of Music. So, starting by talking about my personal experience with this story, only having been familiar with some of the film adaptations, I was surprised by this book. I had been told that the opera ghost was more manipulative in the book, but I have to admit, he wasn't what I was expecting. I always imagined a Machiavellian villain who was so smart he knew exactly how everyone was going to react to certain situations, and exactly what psychological buttons to push to keep everyone under his spell. You know, the chess player who's always 13 moves ahead of everyone else. And while LaRue does insist that Eric is a genius in all things that don't directly involve romance, the manipulation tactics he showed in the book were... I guess a lot simpler than I expected. On the very few occasions where he wasn't physically holding her prisoner, he got Christine to continue to associate with him by breaking down and sobbing in front of her and heaping on the self-pity until she felt bad enough for him to give him a second date. The thing is, I myself and dozens of people I know personally in real life have been in relationships and friendships with people like that. People who subconsciously or intentionally use their own utter patheticness and self-loathing as an excuse to get away with being horrible. And these people certainly weren't geniuses, it's the kind of manipulation that pretty much anyone can do. So, I guess now that I think about it, maybe the basis of my complaint isn't that Eric is too basic, it's that his tactics are too real, LaRue. Too real. On a lighter note, I was kind of amused by the Phantom's habit of telling almost childishly obvious lies to the Persian when he confronted him about killing people. Eric, did you drop the chandelier on that poor woman? What? No, no, that thing fell entirely of its own accord. It was old as balls, an accident waiting to happen. And the Count de Chani, how could you drown him so mercilessly? <laughs> Me? Me? How could you even think that? No, 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 he fell in entirely on his own. Poor bugger never learned how to swim, that's what I heard. And Joseph Bouquet? He was already strangled when I found him? His method of attacking people he catches trying to cross his lake is really funny too. Uh, what he does is he uses a large reed as a snorkel and swims up to the boat from below, singing through his breathing tube so sweetly that people lean overboard to see what's happening and then he leaps up and drags them under. There's a lot of dodgy tricks in this book, but I am definitely going to have to call bullshit on the ability to swim underwater in the dark while singing through a pipe. The issues with dating Eric are pretty obvious, but I can't say that I really cared for the romance between Christine and Raoul either, if I'm completely honest. Jealous boys who lack 
lash out and insult their love interest the second their feelings get hurt don't exactly do it for me as protagonists. There just wasn't that much chemistry between these two in the book, neither of them seemed to actually enjoy each other's company. Raoul had clearly put an idealised version of his childhood sweetheart up on a pedestal in his mind and was getting pissed at the real life version when she didn't meet his expectations and, well I'm pretty sure Christine was settling because her other romantic option was literally a sewer dwelling murderer. Slightly awkward, but I couldn't help but notice that LaRue seems to have a pretty intensely low opinion of Iranian royalty, seeing as he writes them all as bloodthirsty, treacherous monsters. Heck, even the little princess that Eric made friends with apparently murdered her servants and friends just for funsies. The constant cutaways to Richard and Montchamar doing something silly were actually less annoying than I expected. In fact, there was sometimes a welcome break from either Eric or Raoul being a self-pitying jerk. Overall, I found this book to be a bit of a hard read. I think a big issue is it might have been a tad out of LaRue's wheelhouse, what with him usually being a crime thriller writer. As a result, even though this is clearly a gothic horror romance, it still sticks to all the tropes of a murder mystery novel. Things like multiple suspects, red herrings, it's even got a big reveal where a learned man explains how the villain did everything at the end. All these things seem odd and unnecessary in what is extensively a love triangle that happens to involve a sociopathic killer. This habit of LaRue's of leaning on the mystery format is especially an issue for a modern reader because of how much of the book involves building up to the big reveal of what the Phantom's real deal is. Is the opera ghost a complete hoax or is he genuinely an evil spirit? Perhaps he really is an angel of music? Nope, he's a weirdo living in the basement. That is pretty much common knowledge now even for people who have never seen any incarnation of the story, so it's kind of hard to enjoy the unravelling of the enigma. So, to answer the title question of was the Phantom of the Opera book worth all the adaptation children and grandchildren it spawned? Eh. Not really. The writing isn't bad, in fact I'm tempted to track down one of LaRue's mystery novels now that I've experienced his work. There's also nothing wrong with the concept, in fact that's pretty good, it's just that the story as a whole lacks a certain punch and the entire cast of characters are kind of unlikable in my opinion. It would take a lot of very clever changes to turn this story into a masterpiece, so uh, please do join me next time my beautiful watchers so we can discuss how Andrew Lloyd Webber did exactly that. Before I go I would like to give a huge thank you to Il Nedge for writing the intro music and Elisa aka Maven of the Eventide for sharing some of her extensive phantom knowledge with me. It was invaluable to the making of this episode. If I could also remind you that Eric the Opera Ghost Body Count has nothing on the YouTube algorithms, and the only way to help channels keep their hand at the level of their eyes is by liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. So, if you enjoyed this review, please don't hold back on any or all of those things. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you soon. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honour, Sasha I. Edwards, Shelby Holtz, and Matthew J. Brish. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dom, I can't do that, a a mysterious but handsome wizard wearing sunglasses informed me you're spending the money on a cannon designed to allow you to shoot puppies into the sun! And I have no reason to assume whoever that was was making it up for his own amusement. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show that's usually about comparing books to the films they're based on. Nope, other way around. Yes, d how did you even get in here, Sir Terry? The door is closed! The establishment is in the process of changing hands from the two previous owners to Fermin Richard... Richard... Oh boy, I gotta pronounce these names now. Okay. What? No. No, that thing was old as balls. It was an accident waiting to happen. Definitely dropped of its own accord. Le Fantume di Leopere? 
Here are some pictures that match. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't match at all. Squandered his vast inheritance living like a rock star and then ended up, come on, dude. I don't know why I just called myself dude. That's, I've never done that before. It's, I am consistently laughably blad. Blad. I'm, I'm Googling if his name is Weber or Lloyd Weber. I don't know if that's like a middle name or a double barreled surname. Oh, he's been married a lot. I thought he was gay. And is the second longest running, 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 running. Some chapters describe the events of the... Hey, buddy. You're just getting comfy there, are you? Okay. That'll do it. Mean... <coughs> hey. Presumably being played on the instrument he was buried in with... Oh, you buried... We buried him in a violin. It was difficult and confusing. We're not sure why we did, why we did it, but we did it. Fails her mid-song and she appears to make some sort of... <laughs> Convincing him that if he were to let her go, she would love to come back to this dark, 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 doom, doom, dark, doom, doom, dark, make words good. The Persian had popped up. The Persian had pip, 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 He spent some time working in a carnival as a sort of combination of freak show, magician, and pioneer ventrilo, trilo, trilo, ventriloquist. Oh, fuck my life. It's a word I always trip up on. Ventriloquist. Ventriloquist. Okay, ventriloquist. Yeah. What? What is it? Mm? Meow, meow, meow. Actually, do something about him. So he. T right now is when you need to use the scratching post. Is it, Satori? Cats. I am your angel of music. Come to your angel of music. You look terrified. It's by explaining how he used his various hidden passages, trapdoors, sleight of hand, ventriloquism, 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 ven. Damn that word! In the last line of the book, he suggests that he's going to suggest. And I've wrote this badly. I'm pretty sure Christine was settling because her other romantic option was literally a sewer-dwelling monster. Damn it! I said monster. I should have said murderer. He is not a monster. The real monster is man. Well, he, he's also a man. You know what I mean. Please do join me next time, my beautiful watchers, so we can discuss how Android Lord the little Beba. Android Lord Beba. Before I go, I would just like to say a huge thank you to DJ DJ Ilnedge. He hasn't gone by that name in ages. I don't know why I was about to say that. <laughs>